coming. Um, I think this is really an important topic. Um, it's um, where the future is going, and uh, I'd like to um, pass it over really to, first of all, to Bill. Who, from Shepherd Mullen, he's going to say a few words. No, no, we've actually got the man of the hour, oh, Tobin okay. here. Tobin, go on, go he's on. made a late, late arrival. Yep, Come yep. in, Tobin. Yep. <laughs> Do you want to say a few words? You're the host tonight. Uh, sure. Thanks, everybody. I'm a corporate partner here at Shepherd Mullen, and we're um, happy to uh, host these events and uh, looking forward to a good one tonight. So thanks for joining and grab me afterwards if uh, you have any questions. Thanks, Tobin. Um, we're very grateful to Shepherd Mullen. They've uh, supported us growing all last year and this year, and uh, it benefits the whole fintech community, so we are grateful. And I wanted to pass it over now to Mark Albertson. He's a Silicon Valley journalist who's moderated a few of our panels and is fabulous, and he's going to then get the panellists to introduce themselves. Thank you. Well, thank you, Pamela, and I'm looking forward to a great discussion this evening. Um, we're going to uh, get engaged pretty quickly in the questions that we've kind of outlined for tonight's session, and then we'll leave some time for some Q&A as well. Um, I've been, uh, this is kind of timely for me because I was working on a story uh, today, as a matter of fact, uh, involving uh, the blockchain and a company uh, here in Silicon Valley that is uh, building kind of Google for the blockchain, it's kind of a full transparency search function uh, based primarily on Ethereum. And um, one of the facts that uh, was going to be in the story that might be out for me tomorrow in Silicon Angle, or right for it, is um, there's 300 million in transactional value per hour based on their estimates flowing through the system right now. 300 million per hour. So if you do the math pretty quickly, that's like real money, guys. You know, I mean, I'm telling you, that's that's amazing. So um, we can get into some of the details around this, but let me start with the panel first and have um, each of you just talk briefly. Mike, uh, is Mike really a problem here? Yes. Yeah. All right. Try this one. Try this one. All right. One mic. We'll do one mic. How about that? All right. Um, you can handle that. So let me start by having each of you uh, just briefly describe um, what you do and your involvement in enterprise blockchain. Well, thanks, Mark. And thanks, Pemo and Silicon Valley Television. Um, so I'm King Tu, and after a 20 plus year corporate career, I started a leading <laughs> consulting firm called Guardian Insight Group. Um, it's only word of mouth. Uh, best way to explain it is I'm a marriage counselor for companies. So I used to do M&A integration for companies like Wells and Cisco, and I used to do um, partner management for large companies as well, culminating in what's called third-party risk for the Bank of Tokyo. So uh, with that, um, in the last year, I started a radio show on KDOW, 1220 AM. I have the only technology and business radio show in the Bay Area, and it's uh, been great. 50% uh, of the shows have been on blockchain, and 30% have been on risk and security with breaches like Equifax and Uber and the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. So you can look it up, Silicon Valley Insider. And how that means where I got into blockchain is you know, a little over a year ago, and this isn't crypto or ICOs, blockchain service providers is what I'll refer to. And they started coming to me for help on how to make sure that they stay out of trouble as they build other people's chains up. And so I spent a lot of time now uh, advising companies on how to build out their technology in a manner that won't get them beat up when the ICOs that they supported go bust. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kai Stanchko. Did I do that wrong? I'm Kai Stanchko. I work at a company called TrueLink Financial that does uh, financial services for um, aging, vulnerable adults, or people with disabilities. So. Uh, work in financial services and have uh, solved a lot of the sort of subject matter problems that blockchain um, is, uh, is sort of designed to solve. Um, and then uh, did, didn't really see a, a use for blockchain in most of the things that I was looking at and then um, kind of started looking more deeply um, and became internet famous for a blog post that I wrote suggesting that there isn't actually um, any use at all for blockchain. 
And so uh, ended up on this panel as a result. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is So we uh, focus on uh, solving the problems associated with cross-border payments. And we basically provide a software powered by reports blockchain technology to financial institutions. And today, uh, we work with more than 100 financial institutions to help them improve, uh, uh, improve cross-border payments. Uh, currently, many of the banks use uh, old technology called SWIFT, that's a messaging system for cross-border payments that was built uh, many years ago, even before the internet, so it's a really old, antiquated system. We are basically trying to replace that whole system with a new uh, blockchain uh, power technology. So at Ripple, I uh, work on partnership and business development, and today uh, we have a joint venture partnership in Japan and created a consortium of uh, more than 50 banks, and in Japan, that these banks are trying to create a <coughs> new next generation payment system uh, that replaces the existing uh, payments infrastructure. So that's a very exciting development. Um, I, I think I'm here for a couple of different reasons. In the past, I was a management consultant. I ran the I was with McKinsey, then I ran the West Coast for AT Carney, and then Monitor, and then help run the Boost Tech Practice globally. So my clients were large companies, and the issues were you know, corporate strategy, innovation, and I had a bit of a long suit in external innovation and helping stand up new businesses. Um, wrote a book last year, Corporate Innovation and Cathera, around how big companies embrace new disruptive technologies, uh, both in terms of finding those opportunities, but also building cultures that can bring in new technology and put it to work. Uh, but the other hat I wear is I um, help run, uh, along with Randy Williams and Nathan McDonald, the world's largest angel group. We back about 170, 180 technology companies every year. And in that capacity, we do a lot of blockchain. And uh, I'm an advisor at Bitball Capital. My wife chairs the advisor board at Blockchain Capital Partners, and we have a funds to the Credit Capital Blockchain Company. So we're pretty active in the blockchain space. All right, great. Uh, good job. and. Uh... My mic is still uh, you know, straight off here. Um, great job. Um, so as you can see, we've got a great panel, and let's get right into the questions. Uh, so I had to uh, happen to notice that uh, CoinDesk published a story uh, in January, and the headline read, uh, Enterprise Blockchain is Ready to Go Live in 2018. So my question is, are they right? Is it going to go live in 2018? I think absolutely enterprises are um, going live in 2018. Uh, I had a guest on my show yesterday that will air in a couple of weeks, so he's a CIO um, of, a, of a pretty large company. But you know, in December of this past year, 2017, they said that 200, uh, about 250 of the Fortune 500 had already started adoption of enterprise or started enterprise projects on blockchain. And as of uh, last week, I think that the new number is 90%. So I think when we say, is it going to go live, I think most companies, especially companies that want to say they have a technology play, are going to say they're doing something. Now, I think the question is, will it succeed? Will it fail? Is it a real project? Or is it just a, a wannabe um, to say that they have something? <laughs> Here we all are. Um, uh, my view is that there probably will there will be lots of projects that if you know if you're a, a chief innovation officer, um, it's very fun. You can get on a magazine cover. You're very relevant. Um, you can speak on panels. But I think it is very unlikely that any uh, company will roll out a you know what I would think of as a scaled deployment. Right. So um, Swift recently um, had been experimenting with blockchain and kind of. Uh, pulled the plug on it. It was, sort of didn't really, uh, didn't really merit deployment. Um, I think you will see um, uh, Walmart abandon its blockchain project. Um, I think you will see Nasdaq um, decide not to scale out its blockchain project. And I think those were sort of the first three that are now um, at a, a scale of maturity where either they have to um, abandon it or scale it out. And I think <coughs> basically. Um, for all of the ones that are announced today, they will end up pulling the plug. So my answer to your question is uh, yes and no. No, because uh, we actually already had uh, live customers last year. 
uh, one of the first uh, like customers we had, uh, project we had was uh, uh, the Japanese financial institution, largest uh, remittance company called SBI Remit, sending money real time to Siam Commercial Bank in Thailand, real time, and they significantly reduced the cost and also provided visibility to it. And we also had several other customers who actually really implemented like uh, transaction using our technology. Um, and my answer, yes, is because uh, this year is really going to be a major year for commercialization. We've been working with uh, many of our customers uh, like starting a few years ago. And this whole transformation, uh, using the new technology and replacing the existing process takes a lot of time. Uh, we recently announced our uh, one of our major customers, Santander Bank, rolling out a uh, mobile payments app part of our technology. This project, they started working on it two years ago. Uh, Ripple was fortunate. We were one of the earliest players in this enterprise blockchain space. We were founded in 2012, five years ago. And back then, the blockchain space, people were like, oh, libertarian. <laughs> they didn't believe in governments or big financial institutions. So we are really outlier. But now, past four or five years, now we are all talking about blockchain for enterprise. So we see it's a, such a huge change. But because we have been working on this space for such a long time, now we started to see more and more customers actually go and die. Um, I agree with most of what people have said. I'd say it slightly differently. I, I remember being on a panel in probably 1995 on electronic commerce for the enterprise. And I think there's a bit of a cliche which says we overestimate the impact of technology in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. And as the panel have said, what that means is they're all right. You know, there will be less in the short term, but big changes will occur. And I think a theme that I'm gonna come back to a number of times tonight is whether you're a large company, a small company, or an investor, look hard at the rollout of TCPIP, the last major protocol to change the world, it's going to be the same. Well, let's, let's dig into that a little bit because um, there was a report put out uh, not long ago by uh, Gardner that found that 90% of enterprise blockchain projects fail in less than two years. So let's just assume that Gardner's right and the methodology is correct. What do you think is behind the lack of success so far? What, what's holding enterprise blockchain back? I could, but <laughs> <laughs> so, so my view is, is that basically the, the underlying technology um, is, you know, it, 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 she mentioned the sort of like libertarian kind of underlying theme, right? That you can create a database um, that, um, Sort of, uh, you don't need to trust each other. You can transact without trust. It's uh, you know it replaces these sort of legacy systems like banks and governments that require you to trust a middleman. And actually, it turns out that in almost every case, uh, trust is so valuable in the process that actually uh, almost any technology that tries to reduce your reliance on trust, you end up creating these sort of like awkward workarounds. So. Um, for example, Walmart's project that I uh, think they're going to end up pulling the plug on this year, right? They say, oh, you know, throughout the supply chain, we're going to have to, uh, you know, we're going to upload exactly every transaction that comes through. It turns out it's this like it's this comical farce actually of a project, right? Where they're <coughs> uploading onto the blockchain photos of paper documents. They're not even keeping transaction records, right? And this is like this is I mean, it's, it's so it's so ridiculously <coughs> comical that this is what they're doing. Um, and it's permission, which means that only Walmart uh, can add these things to their blockchain, which means that it's no different than if they were storing them in a Dropbox folder, except they're generating headlines by this, right? And you know they could fit it all in a single Dropbox folder that they pay ten dollars a month for. If that was what they really, really wanted. So the the point is that that it's like um, uh, in almost every situation where you want transparency or trust or integrity. People sort of have thought, oh, maybe we can use blockchain to make all of the data accurate, to make everybody behave in a trustworthy way. And actually, it's very easy to enter inaccurate data onto the blockchain. So for example, uh, if I said these mangoes are organic instead of these mangoes are not organic on this piece of paper, if I put it on blockchain, that doesn't change whether I sprayed the mangoes with pesticides or not. Um, and so there, there's sort of all of these things where we sort of hope for a, uh, 
a, a leap of integrity as a result of it, that ends up being just sort of like a, a not quite as good slower database. So I have a, a couple of things uh, to mention. So I think one of the things is that many of the projects claim that they can do everything and don't really focus on the single use case. Before, uh, when we started out, we looked at many different use cases, but then we realized we have to really focus on one single use case to go really deeper into it. Otherwise, you can never make such a big uh, impact. So as a company, we really decided to focus on cross-border payments for financial institutions. So lack of the focus is really uh, probably a lot of problem for many of the projects that were failed. The other thing is that uh, nowadays, there are a lot of uh, innovation offices uh, to big companies focused on blockchain. Actually, they have a mandate, or oh, you have to do some sexy blockchain projects. Yeah. And they just satisfied with uh, doing something, you know, some more like shiny object that can bring some media attention. But then that's it. In order to really get it used in the production, you really have to talk to people who are doing the business, actual business. So we, when we sell our products, maybe a few years ago, we had to go through innovation office, which is such a long process. <laughs> Finally, like after a pilot, you can get to the actual real business people. But now, today, because we have so much traction and also track record, we directly go talk to like the transaction banking people who really understand that business. So just keep innovation on it. <laughs> Thank you. So Mark, I'd say, of course, innovation is about iterative failure. You know, Edison famous, famously said, I didn't fail 900 times, I learned what didn't work 900 times. <coughs> um, in 1986, on the Stanford MBA, they made us dial into the Stanford mainframe to bid for our classes, and professors would put assignments. It was like, what a waste of time. But it was beginning to figure out how to make communication occur over wires. And, and the team that did it became Cisco. So yes, millions of people, talented ones, are putting their energy against this blockchain and they're going to fail and fail and fail again. And they're going to change the world. And you know, Jobs famously said, those of you crazy enough to attempt it are the ones that will change the world. So yes, failure is going to be high, it always is. VC failure rate seventy percent, angel failure rate seventy seven percent. We know it, it comes with the territory, the world's about to change. Thanks. So I think back to the question, like ninety percent of these are Gardner studies. If everyone knows, because uh, we're a little bit older, but if anyone knows Gardner studies, how they do their surveys and how they get these these analytics, it's really hard to say just off of a number of 90% what it really means, because there's, this is a survey of all enterprises, right? So you've got companies like Mark, you have Cisco, where I spent most of my career, and internet failure back before the dot-com bust was no problem, right? We, we could throw money at anything, and, and we just keep trying, right? I think now what you're seeing is, there's still those companies, I'm meeting the heads of innovation at all those enterprises, and they're like, I need, a, I need a blockchain story. And if I don't have a blockchain story, I just have to say I have a blockchain story. Right? So, so that's one that's one thing for people. But at least there's probably some funding behind it. I think the challenge is going to be, and this is more real world, not pie in the sky. The way that enterprises budget for technology, blockchain will be an item, or it may not be. It might be scum works. But this is where what is the definition of a failure? Is the failure that it didn't achieve ROI, which is probably a lot of cases, then that project's going to get scrapped. It's like I promised. Walmart. Like I promised that by getting into this blockchain project, we're going to achieve these results. We're going to reduce errors. We're going to, you know, transform the company. Um, that could definitely be a failure. But on the other hand, you know, and I like where, where Mark was going with this is that if out of the failure there was some learnings that helped us innovate and build better products that serve our customers better, that failure ten years from now won't be seen as a failure. Right? It'll be seen as a catalyst or something else. And then Eddie, who's working on you know, purpose-built things, because Ripple has a, definitely a, a market, and it's definitely um, hitting that market, right? Uh, it's, it's narrowing that ability to say what's success or failure, because that's a, that's a more narrow band. So just, it's a sound bite to say 90% of all enterprise products fail. Because for all those 90%, I mean, I hear really early use cases. And this is like blockchain 101, really simple. We've talked about it. Um, I had a guest on our show that's sponsored by 
Bart Lee's plug and play, Tech Code, Tech Stars, iMentor plug and play. And they're winning every day. They reduce EDI ECH payments by 75, 85%. And that's that's happening. It's not it's not it's not a failure, right? Okay. <coughs> All right, well, let's, let's flip the script for just a second there and kind of turn it the other way. So we have seen interest in different industry sectors around enterprise blockchain. So some of the ones that I pulled based on a number of the stories that not just I have written, but others deal with uh, financial services, government, uh, real estate, supply chain management, media distribution. So these are some of the, the ones that are emerging as potential users of enterprise blockchain for disruption or other purposes. So are there others that you're seeing out there that are not on this list? I mean, are, are there industry sectors that maybe people aren't thinking about that could really benefit from this or maybe they already are starting to look at it very seriously? Yeah, I'll start with the smart contracts, the evolution of smart contracts. I think a lot of the uh, uh, you know, processes that required uh, lawyers before will be basically automated uh, using the blockchain. For example, like will can be potentially be put on with the smart contract blockchain. And I think, yeah, there will be a lot of disruptions at all. Uh, there was an Indiegogo campaign for a football league that was being run on the blockchain uh, where uh, the fans can vote on what play. Um, uh, right. call. And uh, and um, the votes are something very transparent. I, I think something very transformational for all industries is going to be identity management. And I think that um, that's one of the things that I was referring to in terms of you know, you're trying to take trust out of certain things. I think to the point where lots of different industries all need um, identity management, reputation management. Um, I just heard yesterday, I forget which, which country, but they're basically the refugee camps, they're using blockchain with IRS scans to to the working yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 right. So so um yeah, I think that's that's gonna be something that's gonna disrupt many, many industries. <coughs> so I sort of my point well, answer the question by going back in time again, which is to say when TCP IP and the communication protocols first were created. We, we really struggled to figure out how to use them. And there are a lot of people who wouldn't, didn't think it made sense to have an email on their business card. And you know, most companies were struggling. They could say, well, I can sort of see how electronic commerce might work for digital content and for you know, a handful of other things, but physical products, never. And here we are today, it's only 30 years later, and it's inconceivable that any large enterprise is operating. There is no large enterprise operating without leveraging, you know, those protocols into its business. So then you ask the question, what about trust and identity? And I don't disagree with you. The current blockchain protocol is not where it's going to end up. You know, these guys in the room are going to make it faster, more capacity, more peak load, less energy usage. They're going to fix it. It's going to be better. So to say, well, the Bitcoin blockchain won't be able to do payments, of course it can't, because it wasn't designed to, other it was designed to support one currency, not to do the banking world's payments. But I think that the protocol will be iterated and made better and will become more able to solve real business problems. So when I think about industries, I can't imagine an industry where a distributed ledger doesn't bring benefit we're operating under the Medici double entry rules of 500 years ago. That can't make sense. <laughs> yeah, so, so people always say this, uh, the, the internet thing, um, as if, um, as if uh, uh, most things that seem like failures end up becoming the internet. Right, so if you think about what is something that 90% of corporations that have tried decided not to do, what percent of those become the internet, right? And you could say, oh, maybe this is like the nuclear car, right? Um, where uh, they said it was gonna change everything and then nobody ended up wanting to buy a nuclear car because it's you know not, not good, right? I would pay a lot of money if nuclear cars were the only kind that existed. 
Um, I would pay a lot of money to get a normal car that didn't have a nuclear reactor on the back because I would feel very, very safe. It's only because fission hasn't solved that problem. <laughs> Or right around the corner. Um, or having an autonomous nuclear car. There you go. <laughs> um, but but so the um, uh, but actually the, the person that put it best. So in my um, in in this article that made the internet famous, somebody wrote this. You know, oh, this is like the internet. Nobody knew what the internet was for back in the day. Now nobody. Um, and actually, one of the early internet pioneers uh, responded to that comment, and he said, "When we invented the internet, we did it for a very specific reason." We wanted a better way to uh, share files and send messages. That's why we did it. Day one, it was the best way to share files and send messages. And uh, we didn't understand the impact that it would have. We didn't understand how it would transform so many things. But it was the best in the world at what it did. And it, it wasn't this sort of like uh, like solution looking for a problem. It wasn't like you know five years later everybody was like ah TCP/IP. Um, you know, that's you know, it, it, it just it just wasn't like that. It was like it was a success rather than a failure. Um, so Kim, I'm I'm more with you than you think. However, that's always wrong. I worked on the Prodigy strategy in 1990 for Sears. At that time, we were using TCP/IP, but you couldn't get an image to download. So obviously, it wasn't the best technology for delivering communications. Because the only communication, the communications it could deliver were black and white text-based communications at a very slow pace. So the, the innovators iterated, and today the communications include real-time streaming video to Shanghai and people, PMOs fan-based globally listening to us. And that's my point. Um, you know, the, the innovators are innovating and iterating but I'm with you in the sense we're overstating in the short term, and you're right to be reminding us that uh, it's going to take a while. I want to get back to that too. So, so this is a true story. Um, I've, I've never met you, Kai, but when you wrote your article, <laughs> it came out, and I, and I actually said um, that you know it was a good article, and I, and I didn't say it like you had good points. But the funny thing, <laughs> all, these, all these people in my WeChat groups on LinkedIn are like, you're completely wrong. Like, I didn't say I agreed with it 100%. But back to what Mark, I think what we're all saying is, you know, we're in the very first, we, the analogy's been overused from the first inning. I often say that uh, we've invented the wheel of blockchain, we don't have a bike or a car yet, right? There are things that are going to be very transformative about uh, decentralized distributed ledger blockchain, whatever the way you want to refer to it. It's just not there yet. So if we're talking about what blockchain's capable of today, the back to your article had a lot of good points. But I do think that the technology is going to progress. It'll get to a point where it will be very transformative. Well, I want to bridge off a comment uh, that Matthew made in regards to the financial industry because uh, one of the, the things that struck me was a comment from the CEO of the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, DTCC who recently basically came out and flatly said, hey, today's blockchain platform cannot handle the transaction volume that he needs it to handle. So it's a question of scale. And I'm, I'm curious to get the thoughts of the panel. What is it going to take and what do you see out there that will get the blockchain to the point where the DTCC can get its work done? Is it my good to go first? I guess so. It's all yours. <laughs> so. Um, so the first thing that has to be said is today's financial services infrastructure is breaking. So financial institutions are not in the position of not changing. They have to change. SWIFT drops transfers. It loses them. It's a broken, very old system. Equifax has hacked into all our records are stolen. These issues of security, identity, speed of payments, and so on have to change, and they know it. The, the curse of the financial services industry is it digitized first, which means it's got the oldest legacy infrastructure of any industry out there. That has to change. Um, absolutely, the Bitcoin blockchain is slow, energy inefficient, the capacity is minimal, etc. I could already show you a company, but I'm not going to because I've got Ripple sitting next to me, which has already sharded, demarcated, and truncated its private blockchain and already has a peak capacity the same as the MasterCard platform, which is the best platform in the world. 
So, and that's running on a private internet, not in the US. So it's, it's coming fast. Don't, so when the people tell you, I was just in another event where a Stanford professor said, we're gonna use up all the energy in the world. And I actually said to him, you're just being a Malthusian. Whenever you extrapolate today's performance data, you don't get anywhere. But the whole point about these guys is they carry on doing things a magnitude, you know, orders of magnitude better, faster, bigger capacity, etc. That's happening to the blockchain. I think when we talk about scalability, it's really important to understand what kind of property you're talking about and what kind of problems you're solving. Um, at Ripple, so we solve a payments problem, but we kind of break down the payments problem into three uh, major problems. One is a messaging problem. Uh, the financial institution has to be able to send a message with each other to tell what kind of payment and account information, KYC, and so on. Uh, that, and then also um, settlement piece, and then also liquidity problem. Uh, we realized that for settlement problem, uh, we, we don't really need a public blockchain. Instead, what's more important is that interoperability between uh, multiple ledgers, because it's very unrealistic to assume that everybody will be on the same ledger, like a public ledger. Uh, instead, we, it's okay for different banks to have their own ledgers, but providing the way to, efficient way for them to be able to exchange value across multiple ledger is really important. And that's why we came up with a technology called the Interledger Protocol, uh, what we call ILP. And you will probably see more of the, this name going forward, but basically it allows the financial institution to use the existing infrastructure, but uh, use uh, this new protocol, uh, IOP, so that they can uh, transact with each other. And uh, this is, uh, IOP is kind of equivalent to TCP IP. Uh, TCP IP really allows you to uh, send exchange data between different databases. IOP allows you to uh, exchange uh, value across uh, multiple measures. And then the last piece, uh, the equity problem, for this, we use a public blockchain called the XRP Ledger. Uh, that is basically pro uh, allows you to uh, secure on-demand liquidity uh, without uh, the need to pre-fund uh, nostra accounts in destination countries. So for, it's important to kind of look at the different problems, and for this problem, what kind of blockchain you need? And it's not necessarily always a public blockchain, so scalability question can be very different. Yeah, I, I would agree with the other speakers. I'm, I'm not concerned at all about scalability. I think you can build them uh, arbitrarily fast. Yeah, and um, I can't add more than what Mark and Andy said about where things are going. What I can say as a former banker, right, this is a, just a comment that DTCC is what we refer to as a financial market utility, right? And so uh, for me, running third party <laughs> risk, uh, managing them, that we, we basically look at them as a third party, as if they're a vendor, even though they're a quasi-regulated government or an entity. So when there's an incident or when they go down, so the Mark's point, breaking up the seams, you'll never see it that I can't actually say it's them. But when a regulator who, like the Fed or whoever, when they go down, it's an incident. It's just business continuity 101, right? You have to report that. So the scalability of, of financial services will eventually get solved for. I think the more interesting comment here is what, uh, let's say, third world countries who don't have as robust banking systems, or back to libertarians and anarchists, is at what point does the technology get good enough that the financial services are totally disintermediated, right? And that's where, that's really where I think, we've talked about the religious battles, I don't have one yet, but I see it, I hear it from all sides. So people are working <coughs> actively on the public blockchain side to disrupt financials, to disrupt Ripple, right? I mean, they're, they're actively trying for it. And these are people, I mean, we realize that millennials, some millennials don't, will never have a bank account. They'll never be as part of the ring of banking system, right? And they think this is a way to bypass that. So I'm really more interested in how the question turns into that. Now that makes sense. Um, so probably not a week goes by that I don't write some story about AI, machine learning, deep learning, pick your pick. And there was a story in VentureBeat not long ago that talked about a scenario where uh, companies, um, you know, are looking at the possibility of combining AI with a blockchain, you know, basically create, creating deep learning on steroids. So is this, I mean, this to me sounds really way out, but, you know, I've been skeptical about a lot of things in AI and they're coming true. So is this fantasy or can AI really be used 
to extract and analyze blockchain data? And, and are you seeing any use cases or, or leaving some attempts to, to do that? It is you, you Mark. Why, why is it so far out? <laughs> I, I, it, just, <coughs> it just seems like the cutting edge of the cutting edge at this point when we're talking about a blockchain that hasn't even yet materialized in a proof of concept in the enterprise. So, so the panel can, uh, you know, uh, argue with me, but uh, I think it was a month and a half ago, Reid Hoffman and Peter Thiel had a Pettis uh, talk at Stanford, and they basically took a side, so one was a proponent of AI, Reid, and one was a proponent for decentralized blockchain, uh, Peter, right? So it made it seem like they're diametrically opposed or that they're two different philosophies, which I don't agree with. I actually, and I think that might have been entertainment value, but I actually do think that whether it's AI or IoT, it is fully going to be analyzing blockchain data. And, and I don't see why it wouldn't, right? Because blockchain in itself is a distributed ledger, but it's a database. And if the data sits there, something can analyze it. So if you match it with AI, I think there will be um, many use cases for that type of data. I think we see it um, especially being played around with insurance and being able to do actuarial science, right? I mean, that is going to be where we don't need actuaries anymore. We don't need accounts anymore. I, mean, I, I think it's going to happen for sure. I don't know the time table on that. Uh, anyone else can jump in? Yeah, sure. So, uh, uh, so, so Ethereum, for example, is a Turing com uh, complete computer system, which means anything a computer can do, you can do uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. But the question is, um, would you, right? And, and so, this is an example where uh, AI is is using the fastest computers in the world. You're designing for performance. Um, uh, you know, Google, uh, you know, for example, I mean, it's just so much computing power. So Ethereum, you know, it's like maybe what, you know, like a trillion times slower or something than uh, a typical computer. And so, you know, you sort of set, set it back a decade, right? Um, but you can do, you know, sort of like 1995 style AI on the blockchain. And I think basically that performance gap is likely to persist. So I think you will probably always be, say, 10 years behind on what AI you can do on the blockchain versus uh, on sort of uh, what you might call bare metal the processors that are running the blockchain software itself. So I don't think it's, um, I think it's unlikely that that'll be a, a particularly useful uh, place to, to apply blockchain. But I also think, um, you know, the sort of purported advantages, um, you know, the, the first question is sort of like, why would you, right? And so you say, oh, if you have, um, if you're doing your AI on the blockchain, then it's, you know, Dot, dot, dot. And I, I haven't heard anything that was sort of like, uh, like it's great because that means that, um, you know, Facebook can't go back and, and edit the records of what you clicked on on Facebook, which would enable them to sell you the wrong ads. And that's a big problem. And so you want an immutable ledger of everything you clicked on Facebook in order to enable AI on the blockchain. I guess that would be the advantage, but I don't think Facebook really has like an internal ledger immutability problem in the database. So I, I, I think it's um, I think it's like a sort of just an example of like buzzword and salad where it's just sort of like uh, like oh we're gonna do Internet of Things on the blockchain and it'll be um, you know quantum too. Yeah, kind of a similar opinion. Uh, well, I haven't really personally seen any really strong use case for this, and then but I, I've seen a lot of startups say we do blockchain AI because it's cool, and then. We always ask, so do you really have to use blockchain or do you have to use AI? Or is it even AI? <laughs> so it's a, the definition of AI can be very <laughs> different for different people and also blockchain as well. So, yeah. That's, uh... So, uh, Mark, I, I, I guess I'd answer the question in a completely different way. Um, G.K. Gilbert, the founder of the U.S. Geological Survey, wrote a treatise at the end of the 19th century called The Principle of Scientific Trustless. And it basically was about generalization, the specialization, and the argument was mankind, humankind's greatest breakthroughs occur at the overlaps between disciplines because people become very narrow and deep and they're unable to see how things connect. And so if, for example, you took banking or finance, retail, and technology, the biggest breakthroughs of our time are at the intersection point. So technology and banking is PayPal. Banking and retail is Alipay. Retail and technology is Amazon. And so I would then put that onto what you just said. There is nothing that says that artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, 
and sensors, the maker movement, the blockchain, CRISPR-Cas9 are independent topics. They're not. They're all parts of the same phenomenon, which is technology being applied to human activity. So I don't know the answer to your question, but I bet that some of the biggest companies and entrepreneurs and wealthiest people of the future will be the ones that mine that overlap and all the other overlaps. And I would say to anyone in the room, don't write a white paper that's narrow. Look at the generalist white paper because that's where the big breakthrough is. And that's what Ripple is. Ripple is not narrow. It's beginning narrow, you know, international money transfers. But it's a big thought across all of electronic commerce, finance, and technology. I mean, to me, that's like like just setting aside logic, right? I mean, you sort of say like, I, I mean, I agree. Like, innovation happens at the, the intersection, but if, you know, in 1980, if you said, oh, like, what's really changing the world is like light, nuclear power, and computers. But are we surrounded by nuclear flying computers? It just like it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I can buy that. Um, so. Matthew mentioned the biggest companies, you know, in the, in the world or in the room, let's say, and um, one of them recently came out with a statement uh, called Salesforce uh, that said that they were planning to uh, float an ICO. So we're seeing enterprises kind of jumping on the blockchain in a different way, floating ICOs. What do you think, is this kind of a trend? Are we going to see big companies like Salesforce and others now jump into the ICO pool? you know, leveraging blockchain or whatever it might be, or, and, and, and do you think this is good or bad for, you know, the cosmos here? So I'm just interested in the panel's thoughts on that. By the way, at the conclusion of our, our little panel discussion tonight, there's a gentleman who's going to be demoing a product directly involved with Salesforce's blockchain work. So you might want to stick around for that. Let, let me get the comments of the panel. Be crazy not to ICO in this era. Hundreds of millions of dollars out there for trade. Um, yeah, that's tongue in cheek. I think, I think uh, the, you know, depending on the region, depending on your, you know, what nationality or citizenship you have, right? I don't, I don't know if uh, ICO is necessarily the way to go. Um, I don't know how enterprises are going to really uh, figure that out, right? I think um, what are ICOs? It's crowdfunding. So. When I hear of an enterprise going to ICO, uh, what's the purpose behind it? Why, why would they need to raise money in this fashion for this project versus judicial means? I mean, there's a lot a lot of, uh, of scrutiny going on in general. So let's all say about that. So today, it is said there are over 1,500 ICOs, or the currency crypto, out there. And chances are, probably a few years from now, over 90% of them will be common, right? Some of them will be wildly successful, but most of them will probably fail. Because, uh, again, going back to what you were saying, there's uh, no absolute need for actually doing ICO. You could have done something in a different way. And what, so when you look at ICO, you should be really asking, do you really need ICO for this? And why is that? And why you can do that? <laughs> So I have to respond first to Kai's point, which is, I'd already established in this debate that not all ideas are good ideas, and you have to iterate through the bad ideas to get to the good ones. And then I said, the world's biggest breakthroughs occur at the overlap between disciplines, and then Kai created a bad idea to try and disprove my model. <laughs> uh, it was a bad idea today, but it may not be a bad idea in the future, which is another important point. Big ideas are born bad. Large companies have a great difficulty in embracing innovation because they want a good big idea. Doing it in innovation strategy and the O's, um, we have to come up with big ideas that could impact the company at least a billion dollars of revenue per year, and that actually stifled innovation. You have to start up with big bad ideas and figure out how to make them into big good ideas, and that's the process of innovation. So ICOs. ICOs are an enormous, bad idea in this time frame. <laughs> They're enormous because technology-enabled investing is obviously the future. How could it be that the most efficient way for us to back entrepreneurs is to meet them, make them write documents, 
and subject them to impersonal due diligence. You know, we are moving into a digitally connected world where almost everything we do is sight unseen and digital. So why would tech and innovation, why would you invest in be any different? When, you know, working for NatWest at McKinsey, we did the big bang at the end of the 80s, no one believed we'd wipe out all the jobbers, brokers, and market makers, but we did. All large scale, uh, you know, public market trading is done computer to computer now. So ICOs is a very big idea, the notion that 8 billion people can sort through the things they love and send some money to the ones they really want to passionately support. The reason it's a bad idea right now is bad actors and bad practices are why we have regulation, and we took away the regulation with the Jobs Act and other things, the taking down glass, evil, unitary banking, now general solicitation and other things, and the SEC suddenly is sitting up and saying, oh crap, the bad actors and the bad practices are back. So we gotta make it a big good idea, and the way that looks is we take ICOs, we cross them with sensible regulation, and we have global technology-enabled investing. That's the future. One comment, because uh, it's definitely great. Yeah, uh, one thing that we did talk about where I think innovation is going to occur, and this does not have anything to do with the technology, the regulators are going to be, because today's regulations, there's at least six regulators for, when we go back to an ICO, I mean, there's at least, in the U.S., there's at least six primary regulators. And it's funny, because I see, here's another, just for advice, I see people who tend to be regulation experts on LinkedIn as well, and they'll mix and match different regulatory guidance, laws, rules. I mean, everyone, this is the wild west, everyone's pertaining to be something, you got to really do your own due diligence about what people are saying and what advice they're giving. So. Oh, good thoughts. So, this is the time when you get a chance to ask the panel questions instead of me. So uh, we've got time for one or two here before we have to wrap it up. Go ahead. Uh, so you talked about various industries. I'm not sure we talked about one of the biggest, or if not the biggest industry, which is healthcare. So where do you see the applications of uh, blockchain in healthcare? And where would be it first implemented for a bigger success in the future? Who wants to take that one? Healthcare. Healthcare and the... Uh, scheme of the blockchain as an industry potential. What's my blood type? <laughs> I actually don't know. I've seen, I'm 50, what am I, 56 years old. I've seen a lot of doctors. I don't know what my blood type is. It's true. I couldn't tell you. How am I going to find out? Who should I call? I'm trying to call my doctor. They've gone home. The, the office is closed. I'm dying. I'm bleeding. I don't know my blood type. It's true. I don't know my blood type. You know, that's an example. The medical record should be available in real time, anywhere we are, anytime, anyhow, because it's a matter of life and death. And it's crazy that we still operate in a private, closed, ledger-based healthcare system where your personal record is not available to you when you desperately need it. So I use that as an example, but we could go all the way through the healthcare ecosystem and you would find these examples just pop up everywhere. Okay, over here. Yeah, um, I had a question on, uh, from an enterprise's perspective, right? Uh, I see that Ethereum smart contracts are probably you know, more suited for uh, B2C type models and uh, Hyperledger, you know, Fabric, sort of, and what have you, right? It's more suited for enterprises. What are your thoughts on this? Um, is that, is that a, in the coming years, you know, more and more enterprises will look at Hyperledger as opposed to Ethereum you know, for, for various reasons, like right? speed, security, transparency, and all those things. So I, I think uh, we, we've gone through the last hour talking um, kind of around your question, which is we're really early in blockchain technology, either permission or public. And all we know right now, because they have the first mover advantage, is Ethereum, in a sense. And Ethereum on public, Hyperledger, right? Um, we didn't get to one of the questions that we had uh, thought about earlier, but the advice to enterprises looking at blockchain is to be very purposeful, like, you know, be both broad and narrow at the same time. So if you have a specific use case that you can be successful at, 
whether your success criteria is ROI, whether it's successful lead going to the next level of innovation, go for that. But don't invest and say you're done. Because I personally don't think Ethereum is done. Who in the room knows, and, and I'm not the expert, but who in the room knows that there's over 100 liable public chains right now developing? In the next year, because we're talking about 2018, we're going to see chains that are purpose built. Uh, there's going to be there's going to be several IoT purpose built chains. So if you're an enterprise, you want to do IoT, you thought your Ethereum was the only way to go, uh, it might not be. By later this year, one of the companies I work with, which I won't mention here, they're going to be able to lift DApps off Ethereum and put them onto other chains. So now you're not even tied to Ethereum anymore. So that's why I'm saying is don't think necessarily that whatever you're using today. And, and um, Matthew said this a lot before. It's like this is really early. Even things that you think you've made investments in, even if it's a billion dollar investment, you might scrap 18 months from now. I think uh, one reason why Hyperledger is very strong in B2B use case is because IBM is a very back in uh, them and then built a fabric. And then IBM already have a big, big relationship with a large corporation and then it's really easy for them to bring the technology to B2B use cases. But at the same time, uh, Ethereum also is, has an enterprise uh, Ethereum alliance and it's uh, getting a lot of traction as well. So, but also, like Ethereum has a, also kind of developed a community which is a, um, pretty strong. So, I, yeah, I see the whole kind of evolution of the industry happening. Well. Okay, I'm just kind of curious what everyone thinks about what the potential show points are or moving factors that over time could happen. Uh, everyone talks about regulation. Um, I thought this case pretty good. Pretty avidly. Uh, it seems like most countries are starting to adopt more crypto friendly stances aside from India. Um, but you just mentioned the like, developer community. I'm wondering if there's going to be a talent issue here in terms of a talent drain. I hate to use that word from something like general or all the specialized skills that are needed in terms of developing truly top grade you know, blockchain technology or something else. Um. I don't. I, I actually don't think that human capital, capital, and ingenuity are going to be the limiting factors. I actually very much agree with Kai that it's going to be business impact, business models, and demonstrable value creation impact. And that was the internet story. You know, we we all laugh at the pets.com puppet, but how many people in this room buy pet supplies by going to a pet shop? You know, none of us do. Toys, toys.com, came and went bankrupt. Toby Lenz, multi millionaire, you know, bankrupt company. But now Toys R, Toys R Us is finally dead and gone, and we all buy our toys electronically. So I think that um, it's, about, it's about those issues. And I don't think, in fact, Vitaly Buterin says it very well where are you know, the hundreds of millions of people who have been positively impacted. Where are the demonstrable success stories? They're slow in coming, and I think that is true. And that's back to this point that we overestimated the short-term impact. I, I actually think we're underestimating the long-term impact. Kai isn't quite there yet, but on a couple more panels, I will convince him. <laughs> he is going to write a new blog. Just uh, one comment. Um, so in terms of uh, like talent development, actually it's amazing how lucrative blockchain education industry is nowadays. <laughs> Many of the uh, like, universities are like, creating blockchain programs out there, and also there are kind of private blockchain like, boot camp and so on. So I think definitely there is a lot of uh, uh, time development going on. And even in China, like Chinese government has a very negative stance on crypto in general. Actually, they are very supportive of blockchain technology itself. And then I recently went to China many, uh, several times, and you really is surprised at how enthusiastic people are and how eager people are to learn about blockchain. So I think, uh, yeah, talent pool is uh, currently, yeah, it might be limited, but then over the next few years, I think there will be a huge pool of uh, talent coming up. Did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, you, gave, you guys gave a great example of a bad a blockchain implementation with the photocopy and Dropbox. Do you guys have any good tips on a good 
you know, a good uh, implementation of blockchain or use cases. Good. Who's got the good? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I guess the thing I would say is, like, um, just as you're sort of scrutinizing, you know, sort of like imagine that you've built the whole system other than the database, and then imagine, like, would I pick this? And, and to me, my favorite example is, like, people talk about title escrow, right? You imagine, like, the DMV is built on blockchain, right? And so, um, something that you download a virus, and your car is stolen. Like the, the title belongs to somebody else, right? That's terrifying. Now imagine for $10 a month, you could buy DMV Pro, where you have to go into a DMV office and show your driver's license in order to, to transfer your car title. Anyone would pay that. You'd be out of your mind not to pay for the, the Pro version, which is what we have today, instead of the, the basic version, which would be running on blockchain. And I think that that's, that's sort of the, the thing that I think everybody has kind of come back to is, what do you need the blockchain for, actually, right? So if somebody's doing an ICO and you say, uh, what is this for? What is the advantage of blockchain? You're thinking about, uh, you're doing AI, uh, you need to do you know, trillions of operations, computational operations, on a uh, very, very fast sharded database. Uh, is blockchain driving value there? So I, I think, um, you know, and then Ripple has sort of um, had its like sort of tough moments as it's trying to persuade big banks to convert money into XRP and then convert it out, and so so has ended up having, I think, more strength on the sort of uh, message task aspect of it, right? Where it's sort of like, okay, so, you know, the, the SWIFT system, uh, you know, you can you can definitely do a big upgrade of SWIFT. What's the role for blockchain in this, and where do we sort of really need um, an immutable uh, sequentially hashed ledger? And so I think if you can find the thing where your challenge is that somebody is going back and editing a record, um, then I think you really need blockchain for that. But there are so few things where that's really. Well, I think you guys yeah, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna build on top of that, right? So, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not an apologist for Proppy, but Proppy was on my show. Proppy is uh, you know, the ICO in September. They're the first uh, real estate title company on blockchain, so you can transact in Bitcoin, Ethereum, or fiat currency. But the value in this, right? This is, goes beyond a DMV in California. This is. Uh, you have um, you have a forty cousins and you own a castle in Eastern Europe and you have to somehow sell uh, proportional stakes in this because you all want to get out of that or you uh, you have land rights in China same thing so the ability to transact quickly in uh, in easy fashion right uh, the first they were saying that the first transaction for probably happened in um, an overseas flight, it would have happened in a couple of hours, except that the individual on the plane, um, it took him that long to land and then to receive the document, receive the virtual sign off, right? So I think there are practical, we talked about this earlier, there are practical uses for blockchain that are very good. The company I talked about earlier that does ED and ACH payments, um, they are a direct benefit. A $5 million revenue supplier to um, a Korean Steel company or a Cisco, or any type of logistics, a five million revenue company might be spending three hundred thousand a year in EDI payments, right? That, that's a lot of money. So if a company can actually take that, reduce the cost by seventy-five to eighty-five percent. Why wouldn't you do that, right? So I think there are definitely lots of bad ideas, um, and I see more bad ideas than good ideas. I mean, we, we all joke. If any of you are in the in the habit of reading or getting submitted white papers, they can be fifteen to hundred a day, and they're really bad ideas. <laughs> Ninety percent of them are. Yeah. Okay, I think we're about done. But let me turn the mic over to Pebble. Thanks so much, Mark, and thanks so much, panelists. And please give them a great hand. <laughs>